Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder. And last time, Jeb rode around George McClellan's army on the peninsula and fought the Second Battle of Manassas, and we left him on the eve of the Battle of Antietam. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. Join the Patreon page and purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. George McClellan and his Army of the Potomac marched through Maryland on their way to engage Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in September 1862. Jeb Stuart alerted Lee of McClellan's movements and used his cavalry to monitor the Union marching columns. Stuart himself would take some of his cavalry and ride to Harper's Ferry, where Stonewall Jackson was capturing a Union installation. Then Stuart rode back to Lee, informing him of Jackson's situation. The Battle of Antietam erupted on September 17, 1862 but Stuart's role was limited. He and his horsemen were on the extreme left flank of the Confederate Army during the battle, monitoring the flank and keeping it secure. John Pelham's artillery did engage with Union artillery and infantry, but Jeb played a small role in the bloodiest single day in American history. Once the fight ended, Stuart guarded the Confederate Army's rear as it recrossed the Potomac River and entered northern Virginia. It stayed in the northern section of the Shenandoah Valley for a little while, and Stuart, to protect it, placed his pickets and outposts around the bloodied army, with his headquarters at the Bower, a plantation home near the village of Leestown. The home was owned by Adam Stephen Dandridge II, and Stuart and his staff would stay at the home from late September and on into October. After the duties of the day were done for Stuart and his staff, which counting all of the aides and staffers and their slaves numbered close to a hundred people, the officers would relax at the Bower being entertained and entertaining the Dandridge family and the neighbors who came to view the Confederate Cavaliers. They sang and danced the night away on many occasions, and the song John the Cavalry ended the festivities every night. The soldiers became innovative in their ability to entertain their guests. At one point, Harris von Borka and another man stretched a sheet across the hallway of the home and placed a lamp behind them so that it cast shadows onto the sheet. Then they would act out a thrown-together play, one would play the doctor and the other the patient, and as the patient lay on the table, the doctor would pretend to extract all kinds of things from the patient's throat, like deer antlers, whole cabbages, oyster shells, and boots. In one skit, von Borka played a fair damsel, and when the two danced, you could tell it was the large Prussian because his boots showed out from under his dress. After the show, Stuart embraced von Borka and remarked, My dear old Vaughn, if I ever forget you as I know you on the field of battle, your appearance as a woman would never fade from my memory. News of the fun times had at the Bower spread, and soon Stuart welcomed international journalists stationed in Richmond, who wrote or sketched for the London Times and the London Illustrated News, respectively. All was not happiness at the Bower. Stuart still monitored his outposts, and Union cavalry attempted to penetrate the perimeter surrounding Lee's army. At Martinsburg, Union cavalry under Alfred Pleasanton chased away the Confederate outpost. Stuart arrived outside the town in the presence of Rooney Lee and Wade Hampton and said, Gentlemen, this thing will not do. I will give you twenty minutes, within which time the town must be again in our possession. Within Stuart's time limit, Hampton and Lee secured the town again for the Confederacy. Stuart had gotten angry at the loss of Martinsburg, if nothing else out of pride. He had known Pleasanton at West Point and didn't care for him then, and didn't want to lose a town to his cavalry. He also wanted to keep up the reputation of his cavalry. As one Union man observed, wherever Stuart rides, he carries terror with him. His victories are half won before he strikes a blow. Our soldiers feel that he may pounce on them at any minute, and that he is as resistless as a hawk in a fowl yard. Losses by his subordinates became personal matters for Stuart, whose reputation was growing as his cavalrymen won victories and terrorized the Union army. Stuart stayed in constant communication with Lee and visited the commanding general's headquarters regularly. On one occasion, he brought Lee a gift, a quiet sorrel mare, raised at the bower, named Lucy Long. Lee greatly appreciated the gift and would use both her and Traveler as his mounts during the war. Stonewall Jackson's headquarters was closer to Stuart's own headquarters, and Stuart paid him frequent visits. Although their personalities were polar opposite, they got along extremely well, cultivating a great friendship. Some of Jackson's rare humorous statements came as a result of Stuart, or at least in his presence. One night, Stuart came to Jackson's headquarters at Bunker Hill late. He found Jackson asleep in his tent. 
Jeb went into the tent and crawled into bed with Jackson, and the two fought over the covers throughout the night. The next morning, Jeb emerged from the tent to find Jackson standing outside. Jackson said, General Stewart, I'm always glad to see you here. You might select better hours sometimes, but I'm always glad to have you. But General, you must not get into my bed with your boots and spurs on and ride me around like a cavalry horse all night. Stewart also bought Jackson a brand new general's uniform, complete with gilded buttons and gold lace. Lee and Stewart during this downtime constructed a plan for a large cavalry expedition into the north. The destination would be Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, with the purpose being to gather as much information about the enemy as possible, to destroy a significant railroad bridge beyond the town, and to take government officials from Pennsylvania hostage to exchange for southern officials. Plus, Stuart was to find and bring back as many Pennsylvania horses as could be found to replenish southern cavalry, artillery, and draft animals. On October 10th, Stuart and around 1,800 horsemen crossed the Potomac River at McCoy's Ford, heading for Pennsylvania. Once they got into Pennsylvania, the Confederate cavalrymen spread out to gather up horses, given receipts saying that their horses had been taken in payment of damages on the part of the United States against the Confederate States. When Stuart got to Chambersburg, he requested the surrender of the town from its officials, or he would start shelling the town. Some city officials came out, and Stuart was quickly in possession of Chambersburg. Again, Stuart was behind the Union Army, which still remained at the Antietam battlefield. Stuart didn't stay at Chambersburg long, just long enough to capture horses and supplies and burn all the supplies they couldn't take with them. The bridge Lee wanted burned couldn't be destroyed, as the rains and the fact that it mostly was constructed of iron prevented Stuart's troopers from setting it ablaze. Stuart didn't return the same way he came. That would risk running into Union cavalry or infantry since he was operating so close to the Union Army. So he decided to ride around the Union Army again for the second time. By dawn on October 12th, he and his men were near the Potomac River, making a little stopover at Urbana to visit a group of ladies Stuart and his men had become acquainted with during the Maryland campaign. Stuart found Union infantry at the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, blocking their path toward White's Ford. It was a small group of infantry, just one regiment, but if they decided to put up resistance, they could delay Stuart's crossing, and delay could be fatal. Rooney Lee sent a messenger over to the commander of the Union contingent, asking for surrender, that he possessed more than enough troops to destroy the Union regiment, and would do so in 15 minutes if they did not. To Lee's astonishment, the enemy abandoned their position, and the Confederate cavalry began crossing the Potomac River. Federal cavalry were closing in on Stuart's position. His rear guard nearly got overtaken by the enemy, but the quick-thinking Stuart threw out dismounted cavalry and his horse artillery to hold the Federal horsemen at bay until the last of his men got across. One of Stuart's biographers summarized the raid. The Chambersburg raid was a remarkable feat. Stuart had ridden around McClellan's army once more. He had traveled 126 miles and covered the final 80 without a stop in less than 36 hours. En route, he had captured about 1,200 horses and destroyed enemy property. He had taken the war to enemy civilians and made fools of their military establishment. To Flora, Stuart wrote that Chambersburg was as great an accomplishment as his first ride around McClellan and the Catlett Station raid. One authority has said of Chambersburg, I know of no equal exploit in the cavalry annals. Abraham Lincoln said of Stuart, Stuart's cavalry outmarched ours, having certainly done more marked service on the peninsula and everywhere since. Stuart's exploits grew in the southern and northern mines, and he seemed to be everywhere all at once. Southern civilians, when they found that Stuart was close by, crowded to get a glimpse of the young cavalier. He wasn't yet 30 years old, but he had become a national hero. Poems and songs were written about him, including Ride and Raid. When Stuart returned to the Bower, a party was held to celebrate the great raid, and Flora came to join in the festivities. While there, Stuart received a gift from a woman living in Baltimore. He opened the gift, and it was a pair of golden spurs, and Flora buckled them on. Stuart afterward would sometimes sign his personal letters, the Knight of the Golden Spurs. In late October 1862, Stuart was riding near Middleburg, Virginia, and instructed von Borka to prepare a bivouac nearby. When the Prussian entered the town, the ladies came out and begged to meet Stuart, so von Borka agreed to get Stuart to come into town and meet with them for 15 minutes. When Stuart entered the town, 50 to 60 ladies gathered waiting to see the general. They began to kiss his hands and the end of his coat. Stuart commented that he would prefer the kisses 
if they were on his cheek. At that suggestion, the women charged, and as von Borka stated, the kisses now popped in rapid succession like musketry, and at last became volleys. Stuart had to fight to get away from all the ladies who mobbed him, but he finally extricated himself from their clutches and rode away. The end of October wasn't tough for Stuart just because he was mobbed by women wanting kisses. McClellan was finally marching south and would eventually settle near Warrington. Lee would use half his army under James Longstreet to follow the Union army and leave the other half under Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. Stuart and his horsemen had a large task before them. The Cavaliers needed to screen Longstreet's movement to prevent McClellan from knowing that half of the army's location and make sure that the infantry didn't get harassed by the Federal cavalry. McClellan's cavalry, supplemented by infantry, constantly hit Stuart's outposts, forcing the outnumbered Confederate horsemen to fight and then fall back. Despite the Union's efforts, they never did break through Stuart's screen and find Longstreet's troops, but it was definitely one of the most laborious and time-consuming jobs of Stuart's Confederate service. He constantly rode from outpost to outpost, personally leading his troops in the fight against the Federals. At one point, von Borka told Stuart that the general was too far out front, but Stuart was getting irritated about his cavalry becoming too used to retreating and wanted to put up a stubborn stand. Jeb got upset with von Borka and told him to leave if he wanted to, but he was staying at the front to monitor the engagement. Von Borka didn't leave, but he did step behind a tree, and almost immediately three Federal bullets hit that tree. Stuart, satisfied with his trooper's performance, began to move to the rear when a Federal bullet trimmed off part of his famous mustache. Von Borka felt vindicated and laughed at his commander and had a fun time telling General Lee about Stuart's loss of hair. It was during this incredible tour of duty that Stuart got word from Flora that their oldest child, little Flora, was gravely ill. His wife wanted him to come to their daughter's bedside, but he couldn't possibly leave his command during one of the most intense moments of his military career. He explained that if his daughter died, then he would be too late, but if she lived, there would be no reason for him to come. He told his staff, I shall have to leave my child in the hands of God. My duty requires me here. Little Flora died on November 3, 1863. Von Borka read the letter informing Stuart of her death first, then handed it to the general. Stuart broke down into tears, and he had to hold on to the Prussian to keep his balance. He had only found out about her illness on November 2nd, so the suddenness of her death struck him incredibly hard. Stuart asked his wife to come to Culpeper Courthouse, where his headquarters was, so they could grieve together. Flora arrived on November 10th with little Jimmy, not yet three, in tow. General Lee arrived during Flora's stay to pay his respects to the family for their loss. For weeks after his daughter's death, Stuart could be found crying nearly uncontrollably. A light blue flower on a ride reminded him of little Flora's eyes, and he went into a depression because it brought up vivid memories of the little girl. Amidst the tragedy within his family, Jeb received good news. He was given a 4th Brigade, commanded by newly promoted Brigadier General Rooney Lee. Jeb now commanded over 9,000 men, including his horse artillery. In November, the Union Army got a reorganization. President Abraham Lincoln replaced McClellan with Ambrose Burnside, and the new commander wasted no time moving his command to start an advance toward Richmond. He would move east to Fredericksburg, then cross on pontoon bridges to begin the advance. However, the pontoon bridges would be delayed, giving Lee enough time to maneuver his command to block the Union advance. Stuart screened Lee's movements and moved his headquarters close to Fredericksburg. He christened the headquarters Camp No Camp. His staff lived lavishly with Stuart's tent boasting two fireplaces. Sam Sweeney, his personal banjo player, and his slave Bob accompanied him. Bob had been captured during the Chambersburg raid, losing two of Stuart's horses he was in charge of, including one of his favorites, Skylark. By November, Bob was back with Stuart. Although his tent was comfortable, Stuart rarely stayed in it. He was constantly on the move. His cavalry monitored around 50 miles of river outside of Fredericksburg. As the two major armies looked at one another across the Rappahannock River while Burnside awaited the pontoon bridges, the men in each army tried to occupy their time. Stuart and Von Borka witnessed a snowball fight between the divisions of Lafayette McClaws and John Bell Hood, Jeb and the Prussians stood on top of a large wooden box to watch the fun battle. Random snowballs flew toward the two men, and they were forced to dodge and even raise a white flag over the headquarters tent. A large party was thrown about ten miles away from Stuart's headquarters on December 10th 
but Stuart refused the invitation. Burnside's army was displaying behavior conducive to a movement, and Jeb wanted to be there in case he was needed by Lee. The next morning, Burnside's artillery began shelling the town of Fredericksburg. From a hill overlooking Fredericksburg, Stuart, Lee, and Longstreet watched the shelling and prepared their men for imminent battle. Union forces marched across the river on pontoon bridges and captured the town of Fredericksburg, and Lee's men sat in defensive positions on Mary's Heights and Prospect Hill. Stuart guarded the Confederate right flank, Lee fearing that a Union contingent could cross further down river and threaten his flank. John Pelham of Stuart's horse artillery took one gun and performed great service, delaying the Union army on the flank for an hour and a half and dueling with around 50 Union artillery pieces. Stuart had to request over and over for Pelham to return to safety before the young man pulled back. Stuart himself was close enough to the action to be hit by a spent bullet in the collar, but it caused no damage. The Battle of Fredericksburg was a miserable defeat for the Union army and an incredible victory for the Confederacy. The Union withdrew back across the river, and the Confederates went into winter quarters. On Christmas Day, Jackson invited Lee, Stuart, and William Pendleton to his headquarters, which was the office of a wealthy planner, to have a party. Stuart, like always, was the life of the party. Everyone knew Stuart abstained from alcohol, so when he saw the bottle of wine on the dining table, he recoiled in mock horror at the sight. The butter on the table was stamped with a gamecock, and Stuart commented, that that was Jackson's coat of arms, referring to the decorations on the office walls of the blood sport the animals were placed in. The day after the party, Stuart left for another raid into the rear of the Union Army. He took about 1,800 men and divided them up to march along various routes to confuse the Federals as to his true intentions. South of the village of Dumfries, Stuart encountered some stiff resistance that forced him to withdraw from the fight, but he soon went around the impediment and deeper into enemy-controlled territory. At Okaquan, the Cavaliers found a great amount of Union supplies and even took over the telegraph office at Burke Station. Jeb kept his own telegrapher and was soon receiving messages from Washington and the Union Army talking about how they were going to capture him and his rebel band. Stuart sent his own message to Washington, to the Quartermaster General Montgomery Miggs, submitting a formal complaint that the mules he captured from the Union Army were of poor quality and unable to carry off all the amount of wagons he had captured from the Union Army. From there, he headed west, encountering a large Union force, but in the darkness, the Federals weren't able to distinguish who they were. One of Jeb's officers sent word that they would tell them who they were in the morning and built large fires to confuse the Federals, while Stuart and his cavalrymen simply rode around them, avoiding an engagement. Stuart returned to headquarters on January 1, 1863. His Christmas raid had been a success, capturing 200 prisoners, 200 horses, and 80 wagons, with the loss of only one killed, 13 wounded, and 13 missing. The raid got little attention from the newspapers, because the Battle of Stones River and the Emancipation Proclamation got most of the coverage during that period, but Stuart had embarrassed the Union Army once again. Since Stuart's days on the frontier, he knew that if he was going to be promoted in the military and in the minds of the people, he would need to promote himself. During these winter months, that's exactly what he did, he courted the ears of powerful people, some he knew very well. Custis Lee, his old West Point classmate and friend, was an advisor to President Jefferson Davis, and Stuart asked Lee to come visit him at his headquarters and regularly communicated his exploits to him, knowing that Davis would hear about them. He also navigated the hectic waters of Army politics by being friends with both Stonewall Jackson and A.P. Hill, who were two enemies. Hill wrote to Stuart about Jackson, who Hill called a crazy old Presbyterian fool, and said, The Almighty will get tired of helping Jackson after a while, and then he'll get the darndest thrashing. And the shoe pinches, for I shall get my share, and probably all the blame, for the people will never blame Stonewall for any disaster. Stuart continued to be close friends with both men, even though their feud was incredibly heated. Stuart became embroiled in a court-martial when Henry Clay Pate, the man his company saved from John Brown in Kansas, accused one of Stuart's favorite subordinates, Thomas Rosser, of drunkenness and accused Stuart of favoritism because Rosser had attended West Point. On this later accusation, Pate had formed most of what became the 5th Virginia Cavalry and thought he should have been the one to lead it, yet Rosser was placed as commander of the regiment. Stuart's testimony in the court-martial sustained Rosser as commander of the regiment. Jeb also counseled his brother-in-law, John R. Cook, about dealing with Army politics. He stated, 
Be sure, dear John, to keep out of snarls of every kind. They are perfectly abominable. Stuart tried to avoid snarls as well, and even when he got involved, he rarely held grudges. However, that didn't stop others from criticizing him. Lafayette McClaws, one of James Longstreet's division commanders, wrote to fellow division commander and soon-to-be corps commander Richard Yule that Stuart carries around with him a banjo player and a special correspondent. This claptrap is noticed and lauded as a peculiarity of genius when, in fact, it is nothing else but the act of a buffoon to attract attention. Jeb was a showman, and he attempted and succeeded at impressing his superiors. But on a cold, rainy day in January 1863, Stuart planned for a review of Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry. Despite the bad weather, Jeb ordered it to continue, most likely because Longstreet and Robert E. Lee were in attendance to watch the review. Jeb wouldn't let the rain detract from the spectacle, but no civilians came out to watch it as he had hoped. Stuart's artillerist, John Pelham, was a fixture at headquarters. Jeb valued Pelham's companionship, almost to obsession, as one of his biographers declared. For example, after begging Stuart for a short leave to visit some of his friends at Orange Courthouse, Stuart finally relented. Pelham dashed off incredibly early for his friend's home. When Stuart sat down for breakfast, Pelham normally joined him. When Jeb asked where Pelham was, an aide told him that he had already left for Orange Courthouse. Instantly, the cavalry commander rescinded Pelham's leave and sent a courier after him to bring him back to headquarters. Anticipating Stuart's actions, Pelham left earlier than usual so he could make it to his friends without being interrupted by Stuart's rescinded leave. In mid-March 1863, Federal Cavalry, about 2,000 men strong, broke through one of Stuart's outposts. As usual, when a breakthrough occurred, the nearest units would band together and push the force back. Stuart's perimeter of outposts were second to none, and Stuart regularly rode to the scene of the action to direct movements. This force was a little more stubborn than the usual minor breakthroughs, and Stuart brought up his artillery to help push back the foes. The Federals, likewise, brought up their artillery, and a duel commenced. Stuart was able to push back the Federals as usual, but he suffered some casualties, and one in particular hurt Stuart. John Pelham was hit in the back of the head by an exploding artillery shell. He would never fully regain consciousness, and passed away the next day. At the funeral, Stuart cried over the corpse as he clipped a lock of Pelham's hair, and then he turned around and quietly said, Farewell. He wrote to Flora soon after that the child she was carrying, whether a boy or a girl, would be named Pelham in some fashion, and he commented that he wanted little Jimmy to grow up to be just like the gallant Pelham. The Union Army facing the Army of Northern Virginia got a new commander in January 1863, Joseph Hooker. Hooker reorganized the army and got it into fighting shape after the disaster at the Battle of Fredericksburg. He planned to march west and cross the Rappahannock to hit Robert E. Lee in the flank near Fredericksburg. Hooker massed his cavalry under George Stoneman, and Stoneman led a foray into the Confederate-held territory. Stuart's force was smaller, particularly because one brigade was still in the Shenandoah Valley, and Wade Hampton's brigade was resting and recruiting after a long stint on outpost duty at the end of 1862 leaving Stuart with roughly 2,000 men to engage the Federals. Robert E. Lee ordered Stuart to split his already small force and send one half to chase after Stoneman and the other to confound the crossing of Hooker's troops. Jeb stayed with the half that took on Hooker's army, delaying its crossing as much as he could. Once across the river, Hooker made it to the little village of Chancellorsville. Longstreet was on an assignment to southeastern Virginia, leaving Stonewall Jackson's half of the army and a few troops from Longstreet's corps to confront the large Union army. Stuart screened Lee's army and also prevented any of Hooker's troops from discovering Lee's dispositions. On the night of May 1, 1863, Jackson and Lee met to discuss how to deal with Hooker's army now that it was on their side of the river. Stuart rode up with valuable information. The Union right flank was unguarded. It was in the air. 